Hi folks, my name is Girish Bally, the host for Back to Basics, another Back to Basics for another week. We are going to be talking about time management and how to control that time management to get to your goal. And that's what we advertise today. And we're going to do that. We're also going to be talking about his book and what is his journey about his book and why is it so damn important about that book for his life. And that's what we're going to be talking about. You know, it's a very simple thing. A book, time management, and goals. Those are the words that we'll be using today in this episode. And we're going to go and invite Mark to this episode. And Mark, how are you? And thanks for coming to uh, Back to Basics. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So before we get into the basics of the time management, your book, and all the stuff, crazy stuff that we're going to talk about today, what does Back to Basics mean to you? So that's a that's a wonderful question because it's very much in line with Alchemy for Life, which is sort of getting back to basics is basically getting back to the foundations of things. And you you know you can go and get really highly lofty with your goals and all that stuff, but if you don't have a good foundation, if you don't know the basics, then you don't have anything to stand on. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean that that is why I brought you into this uh, show with. A very simple thing and a, and a basic thing in your life and uh, absolutely in my life too. So thank you again, Mark, for coming here and uh, making this day brighter for both of us. You know, let's talk about time management. Do you think before COVID and after COVID, do you think that we have learned our lessons on time management? Or do you think that we're still learning? Well, I, I think what happens and what ended up for me to be the basis of alchemy for life is that people forget that really life is made of three things. And so this is, this is, this is where I'm coming from. So to me, life is made of three things, time, energy, and resources, no matter what you're doing, you're spending at least two of those. And you may be getting one of those back. If you go to work, you're giving them your time and your energy and they give you resources. You may go to your kid's football game and you're spending time. And if you don't want to be there, you're spending energy. But if you do want to be there, you're getting energy and you may not be spending much in the way of resources. But when people look at time management strictly from the position of time, they're missing those two elements. Um, and I'll give you a quick example. And then I'll answer your question because I know I've kind of, I'm, I'm sort of not answering that. So no, 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 you're totally fine. Go for it. Go for it. <clears throat> but when, for example, there was someone I was helping that, um, wanted to play the piano and she couldn't play the piano, even though we had found the time to do it because she didn't have the energy. And it's just like when people want to write a book, they want to write a book and they sit down and they just don't have the mental energy to do it. They're so drained from their job that they have two hours, but they stare at mindless TV. They watch the bachelor and things like that because their mind says, I, I'm done. They drained me for nine hours at my job. So instead of managing that thing they want to do, we have to manage the job and go, well, we kind of need to stop draining you so that you actually have the energy left because energy takes a lot of forms. So when it comes to COVID and sort of the post COVID world and what we have learned from that, I do think that people have learned that. I think they learned a bit more about work-life balance because uh, life was right in their face versus they could get in a car and leave and they could visually say, oh, I'm in a different environment. This is where I work. But then life was in their in their face at home because it didn't matter where they worked. They just had to work. So now it turned into, you know, my kids are here and I can hear them and I'm aware of all that other stuff while I'm trying to work. So it made people a little bit more aware of something that they could kind of block out and and, and just go to work, if you will. I think that one of the positive things that's happened from that, one of the other positive things I think is also that people understood that there were different ways to do things. And I'm all about that. I'm all, all about cheating and finding, well, cheating and finding ways to do something more efficiently and better and so on and so forth. So if you can find a better way to do something, if you can do what you need to do in 10 minutes versus 45 minutes, more power to you. But then there's a lot of people, thank you so much, Mark, uh, for answering mm -hmm. that. But there's, there's a lot of people around us who struggle with time management and they're always running late. Hmm. Do you think, hmm, let me think about this for a second. Do you think that you're, you're respecting the other person by waiting that long? Or do you think that you're disrespecting that person? Because there are two different scenarios here. So explain that if you don't mind. 
So my take on people who are late, um, if you've ever read the five love languages, uh, my one of my love languages is quality time. So it's very, you know, obviously I'm, I'm the time person because, you know, I'm all about time, energy and resources. You know, my love language is quality time. So it's really important to me. And when someone's late, they're saying their time is more important than your time, period, regardless of what excuses they give and so forth. Now, mind you, obviously, if they, they get stuck in traffic or, or if there's a horrible crash or some bizarre thing happens or something happens to a family member or whatever, that's fine. I'm not talking about those particular instances. I'm talking about someone who's a sort of, sort of a serial latest. <laughs> there's somebody who's late all the time. And that's because they know you'll put up with it. And you shouldn't because we all have our own life and it's all synchronized with 27 other things and people. When that person sort of knocks into us and makes us late. It makes other people late too. Just like I'm sure you have lots of things going on in your life before and after this broadcast. And that if I were to be late and, and, and things I would take away from you, I would take away from your audience. I would take away from where you need to be afterwards and so forth. So I think, I think it's disrespectful period. And I think it think it's just getting back to saying, getting back to basics, you're taking the basics away by not being on time. If you can't get that right, you can't pile anything on top of that foundation. Yeah, I totally agree with that. You know, let me throw you another scenario, if that's okay. You know, there's a person that I, I know, and he's an author, and uh, we have talked many, many times offline, and we're good friends. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a scenario that he told me when he was much younger. Um, he applied for a job, okay, and he needed a job, and the employer, meaning the boss or the interviewee, he actually showed up late. So he showed up almost 30 minutes late. And he still waited regardless, right? Mm -hmm. But when he came and he says that I think I'm ready now, he actually said, I don't have time. So, and then he just walked away. Okay, so that interview never really happened. Mm -hmm. But what really happened is that employer called him and he called him saying that you got the job. And he says that he didn't do anything. He says, well, the reason why I'm hiring you is because you're respecting time and you just walked away. Mm -hmm. And guess what happened at the end? He didn't take the job. Because he still feels that that's more of a sorry than versus acknowledging that he waited. So do you think he did a right thing or do you think he did the wrong thing? No, I think he did the right thing. I think unless you were telling me this is some sort of elaborate test that the business is known for, right? Like some inside Amazon, you know, secret Amazon of this is what they do to you when you have an interview. So, you know, don't fall for it. If it wasn't that, then I'd say, well, no, because if he did it, then it's, that's probably not the only time that's going to happen. I mean, he, he disrespected his time and he was called out for it. And it, I, I want to do a callback to it to a book I wrote called The Status Game 2, in which so many things are based on status. And so what what his boss was doing was asserting his status and saying, well, this guy's going to wait for me anyway, because he wants the job. And then and then your friend asserted his status and went, no, I'm too good for this. And then his boss said, uh oh, things have changed a little bit. I can see I want this guy now. And that's not the way to do it. It's, it's sort of like, you know, when people are dating and someone someone pushes someone away. And then that person pushes them back and says, well, I didn't, you know, I don't want to be with you anyway. Oh, now I want to be with you. Well, it's because the status has changed. I just think it's not, a, it's not a good thing. I mean, again, it's a case by case basis. I can't make a rule on paper and say, follow this for the rest of your life. I mean, that's not how life works. Things are fluid and, and so forth. So, but I think in that particular case, he definitely did the right thing. Yeah. Thank you again. I mean, every case, I mean, I, I want everyone to know that this is just one case. I mean, there are other cases and you have to put your pros and cons to it. Uh, right. Yes, he was looking for a job. Yes, he didn't have any uh, salary going on at that time. So he was looking desperately. But I think he felt that salary comes secondary re versus respect. So I think that's his scenario. Your scenario might be different. So I just want to make sure that everyone follows that. And just like what Mark said, every scenario is a little different. Right. You know, Mark, th thank you again for, for coming uh, on the show. So let me let me ask you this here. Uh, the books that you have written, how did that whole journey started? Do you think the storyline came first and the idea came first? 
or did the title come first? I mean, what really triggered you to start this whole process? Well, yeah, I have a very specific answer. I'm really so glad you asked that because I had written four personal productivity books, you know, or, or I'm supposed to call them personal productivity, but you and I call them self-help books, you know, that sort of thing. So I'd written nonfiction books and, and I was getting really good at that, you know, hierarchically organizing thoughts and, you know, and so forth. And I took a break because I needed the market. I needed to, you know, I, and so forth. And I was actually publishing a lot of books in a very short period of time. And, um, I couldn't help myself, but so I took a walk in a cemetery near my house, which I, I like to walk there. It's kind of like a park with dead people, that sort of thing. And um, I heard voices and I don't mean like crazy hoo-hoo voices. I mean, I just heard a conversation and the conversation was so fascinating to me by two people that I was like, yeah, okay, let's go. And I kept, I kept it going in my, in my brain. And I thought, okay, well, this would make the coolest movie. Like, I wish there was a movie that, that this conversation was in. I wish this end was in a movie. And then I was kind of sad. Like, I'm like, well, there's never going to be that movie. And then I thought, oh my God, I need to write this at some point. Hmm. And so then I started to start to, I started to sort of work on a poem for some reason. Like I just started to hear like, like a poem, like almost a medieval uh, poem. And I ran home and I wrote this poem, five minutes. I write this big, long poem and I looked at it and I thought, okay, that's the outline of the book. I guess I'm writing this this um, epic epic sci-fi fantasy kind of thing, and so that's that's that was the genesis of this book, and it was the the bizarrest thing for me. Like it was so strong, and it just and I just I had this mission. I was on a quest. I just had to do this, and this was a good sized book. It's like 410 pages. It's not a tiny book, and it's um, and so I wrote the book, and thought, wow, and and I just and so to answer your question. The outline and the the for the book came and the and the title sort of popped into my head too about the book because of the subject matter. It was very intimate into it. And that's the sword and the sunflower. And that is actually what the what what the, this fiction I'm talking about was. And that was the genesis of the book. And then when I got done with the book, even though it has a is an ending, I was only halfway done with the poem and I thought. Well, I guess I have to keep going, and so I ended up writing the second part, if you will, or the or the the, the epic conclusion to this, which then truly finishes off the poem. But I guess I have to tell you, I was terrified because there was something about the process of writing this book that made so much sense to me, even though I hadn't really delved that deeply into fiction before. I had written some stories in the past and so forth, but when I wrote this, I thought I can't do this again. This is like lightning striking. This was a one-time thing and I need to give up. And I was two chapters into the second book and I was like, wow, I'm back. This is the way it felt for the other one. I'm back with these characters and it's, it's, it's such a, it was such a cool thing. So that's basically the way that that happened. And now I'm on the third book of that. I released that a few months ago. It's actually the prequel. So it's a duet or duology of two books. And then it's the third book, which is actually a prequel to those two books. So that was my, that's my foray into fiction. Okay, so th thank you again for that. So it seems like it was not the story or the title. I think it was the poem that it came out first, from what right. I'm understanding. So right. th thank you again. And 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 one of the books was 400 uh, pages, 400 plus pages. So did you think that it was too long, or do you think that you should divide that, or do you think people uh, appreciate that length? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, no, those are those are wonderful questions, and in fact, they went through my mind because I'm writing this book and having written only shorter stories and the, and the largest book I'd written was about 50,000, 60,000 words. Uh, we're up in the nineties, 90,000, 96,000 words. I think it was. And so my editor told me, she said, Mark, this book is going to be as long as it needs to stop worrying about how long or short it is. Just tell the story. And that was, that was empowering that I thought, okay, Okay. And that was it. And the interesting thing about it is it, both books are about 400 or so pages each. I mean, one's 455, I think, but who's counting? Um, when the, there are these, there are these bookstagrammers who, who've reviewing my books and so forth. And it is just one, some of them are such wonderful people and they devour these books in like three days or sometimes two days. And I'm shocked. I'm thinking, well, they're skimming it, but they're not. They just devour these books. And I see my books stacked up to some of the other books and my books are actually smaller. And I'm just stunned at that, that, 
that these books are so long. So the length of the book, and that's what I would say to writers is, is, you know, the, your story is as long as it needs to be, you know, do you have to get to the point? Do you have to make sure that, you know, your plot moves and, 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 and your tone is set properly and all that other stuff? Yes. But, um, the length of the book is really going to be determined by the story, not by you, which is, which is weird. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again. I think you made it very clear that I don't think the, the length of the book matters. When I say length, I mean pages. Right. I think right. it matters to tell the story how it is. I think just just like what your publisher said. Right. Um, so I, I want to make sure the reason why I'm asking is because I'm pretty sure there's a lot of you know writers out there listening to us want to understand that what is the length of the, the book? And usually there's no right answer. I mean, you just have to tell the story, whatever the story well, is. Yeah, and that's sort of okay. So, so that kind of breaks down. There's a fork in the road. There's short stories, and then there's novels. And you know, novels are are typically seen as being, I think it's fifty thousand words or more, or something like that. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Something yeah. like that. Um, you may have a short story on your hands, and there are, and people when they start writing, they think, well, I'll do the easy thing. I'll write a short story. But the, the odd thing is, for a lot of people, the short story is actually the harder thing to write, because you have to be so concise. And what you're doing and the same thing is true for a screenplay <laughs> i mean screenplays are basically what is 100 and something 100 to 120 pages or so representing about two hours those are much shorter than a novel and your brain has to adjust to that sort of thing so yes it, it depends what you, what you want to convey i tend to really enjoy character driven stories because i think it's all about people i mean look at you and i we're just sitting in a box there's no explosions going on behind either one of us or anything. We're not moving. We're not running from the bad guys. We're talking. And, and I'd like to think at least that this is very interesting. And it's conversation. Conversation is what drives emotions. Conversation is what allows us to connect with the characters and so forth. And so I think you can have two people sitting in a booth talking the entire time for a book, and it could be interesting. Uh, and you can have all the action in the world. But if you can't relate to, to the people in there and you don't care about them, it doesn't matter. So I think let the characters drive your book, but you know, you still have to manage that. Yeah, of course. Of course. I, uh, Mark, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and ask you this question, but I think I have a feeling what the answer is going to be mm -hmm. because the way you're talking and, and talking about the characters in the book, do you think that your book is a TV show or a movie? So not that I've given that a lot of thought, but, the um so that so the duet would be two movies so sword and the sunflower would be a movie amira would be a movie and then upside down would be about a five season netflix <laughs> um i i be, because of because the the prequel takes place over a thousand years it actually explains what happens over a thousand years and i wrote that as sort of a thank you to the readers who were saying you know they really fascinated by what had occurred be oh and i should back up the sword and the sunflower takes place a thousand years from now. So we kind of jump to a future, a post dystopian future where a sort of medieval society has kind of re-risen up and so forth. And a lot of the technology is forgotten and so forth. But I thought it was important to write the prequel, but there's so much in the prequel, obviously fitting a thousand years in one book is not easy. So I think that would be a best fit for kind of an episodic seasonal seasoned kind of thing five seasons so yes i think sword and the sunflower makes a movie amira creates a movie too but i have the dilemma in that when you when you write character driven fiction there's a lot of nuance there there's a lot of things that the characters go through you can't really do that in a movie unless you put a lot of narration in there i mean unless you're going to be one of those movies where you hear people think all the time there's no, you have to be careful on how much time you take to convey things like that so you can lose out on that because what what you're doing, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, because what you're doing is you're you're peeling the onion layer by layer for that character, and you're trying to understand where that character came from, what he or she is doing, and what they're gonna be doing. I don't think you can pan that out in the movie, in in a two three hour movie, maybe a part one and part two, but I think the essence might just go away, and I think the TV show would be better. That's just my thought. And that could be, and you could be right too about even, you know, the sword and the sunflower and that maybe it makes for a better series because it is, it's a hero's journey, you know, and, and I think those are the most 
fulfilling to write is something in which someone has a character arc and they start and they and they and they move through it. And so much fiction these days in movies, people don't have arcs anymore. They start out being perfect, and you can't relate to them yeah, because yeah. you know people need to have flaws. You know, Mark, you you have talked about all these all these uh, books that you've been uh, writing, and and it's and what we talked about earlier is time management. Mm -hmm. You know, this it feels like that you like time is the is a thing that it's oh. running around your your life there. Can you explain what you do and why is time the the key word around your life? Well, sure. I I, I think um, I kind of have my hands on a lot of things. So I I like you. I have a podcast um, talking about time, energy, and resources. I do coaching for people who want to do time, energy, and resources, and it's sort of an umbrella because it really covers everything. Um, I do. You know, I've written the productivity books. Uh, Alchemy for Life is actually one of my books. It's called Alchemy for Life: Formulas for Success, and it's all about time management and things like that. I just have found that, you know, time is just, it, it's, it's a fascinating thing because we all have to deal with it. And, you know, and um, my concept of it is that, and that's why you have the flask and just, oh, wrong side. That's why I have the flask and so many, so much of my stuff, including, you know, my, um, it's the logo for Alchemy for Life. Because I think we all start out with our flask filled with time, energy, and resources in the beginning of the day. We wake up. We spill some out. We spill some out for friends. We spill some out to cook. We spill some out for our job. We spill some out for the stuff that happens in our life, our kids, hobbies, all that stuff. And sometimes we may get to like seven o'clock at night and go, oh, it's 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 empty. <laughs> now what do I do? And I think if you don't realize that's happening, instead, just you just pulled along through the clock, just pulls you along through the day and you're like a slave to the clock, it's just not going to work. So you need to realize where you're pouring that stuff. If you pour a whole bunch of energy into something, you're not going to have much left for you. It's it's just like people who put all their energy into their job, they come home and then they're not helping with the kids and they wonder why their, their wife doesn't want to go on a date night on Friday because she's exhausted because she's the 98% caregiver of the children because you're exhausted from work and you don't do anything when you get home. So, you know, I just think it's it's such a prevalent part of our life, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again, Mark, for explaining that, because you know what? It seems like your life and and what you're doing, it's revolving around just one word, which is time. Time. Uh, and and that's that's why I define that. So thank you. Thank you again for uh, explaining what you do and what you're doing and what you're going to be doing. You know, one last question, if you don't mind, what what do we see Mark in five years? It seems like you've done a lot yet it seems so less what do you think what are your thoughts um i i, I would love for you to expand on it, it seems so less i'm not sure what you mean well it, 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 it seems like <laughs> okay so you know less meaning you got the podcast you got the books you got speaking with me you got writing this and writing that and thinking other directions it seems you're doing a lot <laughs> you know so so what is Mark doing for the next five more years? Mm. Um, so because of the lockdown, something that I was really ramping up was speaking. And I love speaking. I love public speaking. Um, and I was really starting to enjoy that. I've taught classes on writing for uh, children and adults. And I actually opened up an online school and have classes online for people, which is really fun. So because of the lockdown, all that stuff just dried up and not a lot, not a lot of people were too interested in like a zoom call because everybody was zooming everything. So if you're going to speak via a zoom call, nobody cared, or, or at least the interest level wasn't where it really needed to be. So I see the speaking kicking back in. I would love to see that kick back in. I may have, you know, a gig this summer in which I teach uh, at a retreat for, for aspiring writers and things, which is so cool. Uh, I've already, like I said, created classes online. I had been looking for a platform to use for years. And as somebody who also has a background in being a full stack web developer, and you know, I've created a writing site from scratch. I created a dating site from scratch. Um, I, I was going to create a teaching site from scratch. And I thought, you know what, Mark, just for once, just let someone else do that and just focus on the teaching part. So I see that as, as something people will see. I see 
I see more fiction. I I actually have two books already written. I'm just sort of staring at. I'm not sure exactly how to market them and under what uh, under what umbrella to put them. Um, and and I'm writing another fiction as well. In so I guess I have three books. So I, I see mostly a lot of the the writing and the speaking. Uh, the podcast is fun. Uh, the podcast interviews are fun, as as I'm sure you you know, because I think your podcast is it a 100 interviews? Yeah, totally 100. percent Okay, so so mine is more of a 80 20. It's 80 percent me yakking, and then 20 percent interviews with people. So I do enjoy both of those things. Ramping that down may happen. Um, so I guess I see more books. I see a lot more speaking, and um, and so forth. Yeah, thank you, thank you again. And now I think of it, I think it is at 80 20. Because I do my solo shows also. So Oh, you do yes. have solo shows. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you again, Mark, for explaining that. Before you leave today, do you have any last words for all the, the Back to Basic listeners and viewers? And how was your journey on Back to Basics before you leave? Oh, well, let me ask, let me answer that in the reverse order. Well, this was fun. This was um this was a, a lot of fun. It's nice to um have a have a chat, have just a just a fun, easy chat with some direction. I appreciate that you keep it sort of tight because I've been on podcasts where there's a lot of <laughs> the, the time gets away and, and I think it dilutes what your guest is trying to do and so forth. So this has been fun and I appreciate you having me very much. As far as what I would tell the back to basics people, I mean, I would say people who want to, uh, to write, you have to give yourself a license to write because it feels like you're screwing around. And in a way you are because it's, it's fun, but it is work and it can be, you know, employable. <laughs> it can be a job, but like anything you put the effort in, you get something back out. Understand also when it comes to time, energy, and resources, I would say, just understand that time is not enough. You have to manage your energy as well. And in some cases, your resources, if you really want to go out and do that thing, it's going to cost you money in some cases. And you can't say, well, I'm just going to cheap out. I'll waste all this money on everything else in my life. But me, I'm not important enough to spend money on. You know, So we, we, we do that to ourselves all the time. And that's where the terms like self-love and self-care come from. Because we really don't do that enough. So um, I guess that's you know that's what I would say. And hopefully there's some links to, to my stuff for people to, to, to look at. Um, you know, if they want to look at the time management stuff for the podcast, that's alchemy for life. There's no the, it's just alchemy for life and they can get the podcast there. I've had some interesting interviews. And then as far as all my other stuff, you can just go to markbradford.org and you'll get my books and, and all the other goodies that I'm involved in. And they're all available on Amazon and audiobooks and, and Kindle and so on and so forth. Yeah, Mark, thank you. Thank you again for coming on the show and Seriously, I, I've learned a lot of things from you. I've learned uh, how that. to and what to do when when you want to write a book. I've even learned about time management. So thank you again for all the stuff and all the advice that you've given us. And hopefully we'll meet again for all your other books that were coming in the way. And hopefully I'll be part of that journey uh, too. So thank you again, Mark, for, for being here and uh, supporting me. Yeah, I think you already are. And so I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So guys, we spoke with Mark today and we talked about the basics of life and the basics of time and his book and what his journey is all about. There's one thing that he did say that, you know what, time is so precious. You just need to write and write and write. I mean, that's just my definition. Now, as usual, as always, there is a quote of the day from Back to Basics and hopefully my guest will like the, the quote of the day. The quote is, the key is not spending time, but in investing it. Now he has invested so much time of what he does and what he's doing on podcast and writing and everything else. He's an amazing person. So guys, as usual, what do I always say at the end of the episode? Everything in life goes back to basics. And that's what we did today, guys. Guys, take care. God bless. Keep on commenting on all my episodes. It helps me in the long run that I'm hearing from you. And any comments is a blessing to me and the show. And thank you again. Guys, as usual, as always, take care, God bless, and I will see you next time on Back to Basics. Next week's episode on Back to Basics. I was so unfulfilled, and my spirit was not lifted. It was actually the opposite. I was in quiet desperation. 
And I finally took a chance on myself. I quit the pharmaceutical industry uh, after 17 years and uh, started this journey of being an entrepreneur and this self-discovery. So that's that's really in a nutshell kind of the journey that I've been on in the last several years. And that's what a spiritual warrior is. And it's a it's a challenging journey and and not one not one that many are willing to go on. Yeah, thank uh, thank you, Troy.